Good afternoon. Hi, I'm David Ferriero, the Archivist of the United States, and it's a pleasure to welcome you today to the National Archives for today's lecture. Whether you're here in person or joining us through our YouTube channel. Before Stanley Weintraub comes out to talk about his book, I'd like to alert you to two other programs coming up here in the McGowan Theater. Next Thursday, December 11th at 7 p.m., Tim Gunn of Project Runway will be back to host a panel discussion on White House holiday decorations through history. Panelists will include Linda Johnson Robb, daughter of President Johnson, Genevieve Gorder, host of HGTV's White House Christmas, former White House Chief Usher Gary Walters, and Colleen Christian Burke, author of Christmas with the First Ladies. The program is called Deck the Halls, Holidays at the White House, and is presented in collaboration with the White House Historical Association. And you'll also be able to purchase the 2014 White House Christmas ornament that evening. On Tuesday, December 16th at noon, we'll show a compelling film chronicle of the Battle of the Bulge on the 70th anniversary of the battle. That includes newsreel footage and film from German and American archives. To learn more about these and all of our public programs and exhibits, consult our monthly calendar of events in print or online, and there are sign-up sheets in the lobby. Another way to get more involved with the National Archives is to become a member of the Foundation for the National Archives. The Foundation supports all of our education and outreach activities, and there are applications for membership in the lobby also. Our guest author today, Stanley Weintraub, has written several books during wartime Christmases, the Revolutionary War, the Civil War, World War I, and World War II. In his latest book, he now turns to a war that he knows personally, the Korean War. Here at the National Archives, we're proud to be caretakers of the records documenting the Korean War. The military service records of veterans, such as Professor Weintraub, are housed in our National Personnel Records Center in St. Louis. Here in the Washington, D.C. area, we have the records of the military departments, and the Truman and Eisenhower li libraries contain many resources for the study of this war. Toward the end of 1950, General Douglas MacArthur promised what many leaders had promised in previous wars, the troops would be home by Christmas. Just before Thanksgiving, he announced an offensive to end the war by that date, but tens of thousands of American troops were trapped by the Chinese along the Yalu River border. In A Christmas Far From Home, an epic tale of courage and survival, Stanley Weintraub tells the story of surrounded American troops battling both enemy troops and treacherous terrain and winter weather. One reviewer of the book remarked, Weintraub expertly delineates the unraveling disaster for the entrapped, frozen, dispirited troops on the ground. Stanley Weintraub, a native of Philadelphia, received his bachelor's degree in education from the Westchester State Teachers College, now Westchester University of Pennsylvania. He continued his education at Temple University, where he received his master's degree in English in absentia, as he was called to duty in the Korean War. He received a commission as an Army Second Lieutenant, served with the Eighth Army, and received a Bronze Star. After the war, he attended Pennsylvania State University, where he received his PhD. He remained at Penn State for the entirety of his career and was the Evan Pugh Professor of Arts and Humanities at the time of his retirement in 2000. From 1970 to 1990, he was also director of Penn State's Institute for the Arts and Humanist Humanistic Studies. In November of 1982, Westchester University inaugurated the Rodell and Stanley Weintraub Center for the Study of the Arts and Humanities. And Rodell is with us in the audience today. Stanley is a prolific writer, having written over 40 books. Among his most recent titles are Pearl Harbor, Christmas, A World War, Final Victory, FDR's Extraordinary World War II Presidential Campaign, and Young Mr. Roosevelt, FDR's Introduction to War, Politics, and Life. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Stanley Weintraub. So I don't talk too long, I'll take off my wristwatch and have it handy. <clears throat> uh, 
About 30 years ago, my wife and I were in Tokyo uh, on a research trip. I was writing about the end of World War II for an earlier book. My Japanese publisher, Chuo Koran Shah, uh, arranged to take me to see General MacArthur's office, which was still uh, kept intact, and it still is. The Daiichi building, uh, an insurance company building across the uh, big highway from the Emperor's Palace, <clears throat> was MacArthur's headquarters during his time as shogun of Japan. Uh, I wondered why the building survived uh, all the fire bombings. Uh, more Japanese lost their lives in the fire bombings than they did in the uh, combined two uh, atomic bomb attacks. <clears throat> but it turns out, uh, despite rumors that MacArthur ordered the building saved from bombing so he could have it for his office, uh, that wasn't true. Uh, the pilots were warned not to bomb the emperor's palace. <clears throat> so they kept a wide swath around the palace and the Daiichi building was saved. Daiichi means number one, number one insurance company. Uh, we were picked up in a big long uh, black Toyota limousine uh, at, at our hotel and taken to the Daiichi building and escorted by one of the vice presidents of the insurance company uh, to MacArthur's office on the sixth floor, the top floor. It overlooked the emperor's palace. On the wall outside the office was a plaque that said that G General Douglas MacArthur uh, was the occupation commander of Japan for five years. Uh, he used this office uh, and he saved Japan. He saved Japan. Well, he did. He saved Japan uh, because he protected the emperor, and therefore he protected the culture of the Japanese. Uh, the vice president motioned to me uh, to walk into the room and sit down in MacArthur's armchair facing the window. I did. The armchair was quite worn at this point, the green leather was quite worn by all the VIPs that apparently had been motioned to sit in it uh, over the years, and I guess they still do. The visit was really a very important one for me because I understood MacArthur better from that than anything else. MacArthur overlooked the emperor's palace for five years. He, in effect, was replacing the emperor, uh, and his imperial style was exactly what the Japanese needed when the emperor was uh, uh, doomed to be just an also ran, a, a not very important citizen. So MacArthur's imperial style had a lot to do with the occupation of Japan. He had no telephone on the table. Uh, he never used a telephone. Uh, he kept a notepad, and that was about all. Uh, people came in and gave him messages. But the important thing was that he was the imperial czar uh, of Japan. Uh, what did that have to do with the Korean War? MacArthur suddenly discovered late in June 1950 that the North Korean communists had invaded South Korea and that he was ordered by President Truman to try to repel the invasion. What did he have to repel it with? The Eighth Army was the occupation army in Japan. He had never once visited his occupation army. He sat in Tokyo. Uh, he lived in the former ambassador's palatial residence, uh, had grand dinners there every evening. Uh, he left only to go from his embassy residence to the Daiichi building every morning, and then of course he left at lunchtime, uh, went back, had uh, an, a lunch and a nap, and uh, then returned uh, to the Daiichi again. When did he see his troops? Some of them marched past every now and then uh, to show him what they were like. 
he never knew how badly trained they were, if they were trained at all, uh, because he never visited them. Uh, his wife did. Uh, he sent Jean MacArthur with a general or two to various encampments uh, so that they could review the troops. Uh, the troops barely knew how to fire a gun. Uh, they had World War II equipment. Uh, they didn't have anything new. It turned out that when he sent troops into Korea uh, with World War II bazookas, rocket launchers, uh, the rockets bounced off the new Soviet tanks uh, that the North Koreans had. In other words, we were totally, totally unprepared uh, to repel the North Korean invasion. That didn't stop MacArthur, though. Uh, uh, he asked for more troops. Uh, he got some of them. Uh, among others, he got the uh, First Marine Division, which was the most professional group of, uh, of soldiers in uh, the armed forces. The Navy and the Marines combined uh, to invade Incheon Harbor above Seoul about three months into the invasion and uh, cut off perhaps 100,000 North Korean troops in the south. Uh, they had to surrender. Uh, we had quite a time of it when they surrendered uh, because there were so many of them, we had no place to put them. Uh, they were marched to fields where they had to sit while barbed wire was strung around them uh, as temporary camps. The war was over, or at least it seemed to be over. It wasn't, though. Uh, we had taken over most of South Korea, taken it back again. Uh, but MacArthur was convinced that he could end the war uh, by unifying Korea, by going farther north, by going into North Korea itself. He was warned not to do it. Uh, the Pentagon warned him, for example, uh, that if he went into North Korea, uh, he better watch out for uh, the Chinese infiltrating down and uh, taking him by surprise. He said that wouldn't happen. The Chinese were intimidated by that quick victory at Incheon, that he was not likely to have that happen. He was going to do this anyway. Uh, of course, he seldom obeyed orders from Washington. After all, he was the senior general in the United States Army, uh, the only active five-star general. He had an idea. He was going to repeat the Incheon invasion on the other side of Korea. <clears throat> he was going to send troops all the way around the south of Korea, that is, send them south around the peninsula, which was like a thumb sticking out of Asia, and send them north uh, to land in North Korea. And he would do that using the Marines as his uh, basic uh, armed force. He wanted to give his deputy, his chief of staff, an extra star. Uh, Edward Almond had uh, two stars of a major general. If he were the leader of his own army corps, uh, he could earn a third star, perhaps. And so MacArthur invented the 10th Corps, uh, which was to go around Korea with the Marines. It took about a month to get the Marines and the Army troops with them, uh, back on their ships, uh, provisioned with um, more food uh, and more ammunition and armor, and send them to sail around Korea. When they got there, they found a surprise. The North Koreans had mined the harbors. The ships couldn't come in. On the other hand, Bob Hope managed to come in uh, Bob Hope came across by land to entertain the troops, and he found there were no troops yet. They were all out at sea. He had to be ferried out to an aircraft carrier out at sea uh, to entertain uh, some of the troops. So we were way behind in schedule, and winter was coming. Nevertheless, MacArthur was sure that he could end the war by Christmas. This was already... Uh, late fall in 1950. How do you end the war by Christmas um, without defeating the enemy in the north? Well, he was going to go all the way 
to the Yalu River, which was the boundary between uh, Chinese Manchuria and North Korea, uh, and cut off whatever troops were left. He flew in to Korea uh, to the biggest airport that was available to us uh, the day after Thanksgiving. The day after Thanksgiving, he made an announcement uh, to the 8th Army uh, that the offensive was to begin the next day and that they were to go all the way to the frontier and unify Korea. Uh, and he would assure them that if they weren't home by Christmas, they'd be on their way home. This was Thanksgiving. This was the last few days of November in 1950. Christmas was only a month away, but he was sure that he could do it. Not only was he sure that he could do it, uh, he felt that if he did, he could then run for president uh, in 1952. The primaries were hardly more than a year away, uh, and he would be the leading candidate for president. Not long before, uh, Dwight Eisenhower had visited him in Tokyo when Eisenhower was still chief of staff of the army, replacing George Marshall. And the two of them talked in MacArthur's office in the Daiichi, um, MacArthur saying, Dwight, I'm sure you're going to be the next candidate for president. And Eisenhower said, no, Doug, you're going to be the candidate for president. Of course, they both wanted to be president, uh, but they, uh, of course, lied to each other, as always happens on such occasions. It turned out Eisenhower would become the next president after the war was over. But the war was not over in Thanksgiving of 1950. The Siberian Express was coming down. The troops called the winds, the winter winds coming from Siberia, the Siberian Express. It was so bad by Thanksgiving Day in 1950 that when the troops raised their Thanksgiving, <coughs> Thanksgiving dinners to their mouths, the dinners froze before they got there. And they talked about eating turkey, turkey popsicles uh, for Thanksgiving dinner. Turkey popsicles. It was getting to be 20 below zero. Nevertheless, MacArthur, of course, didn't stay. Uh, he announced the offensive. The Chinese were amused. When does a commanding officer announce an, inf an offensive? Uh, these are supposed to be uh, shocks, surprises. They knew all about it. They had known about it for a long time. MacArthur flew home to a good dinner in Tokyo. Uh, and when he arrived in Tokyo, uh, after a trip over the Yalu River Basin that his uh, pilot, Tony Story, had taken him on, he announced to the Pentagon uh, that he had seen no Chinese troops, uh, no troops at all. Of course he hadn't. He was flying at 9,000 to 10,000 feet. Uh, how many of you have ever seen a person walking along from that height if you were in an airplane? You, you just don't. But he said he had completed his reconnaissance, and there were no Chinese. And when he landed in Tokyo, uh, General Stratemeyer, the head of his Air Force, awarded him a Distinguished Flying Cross for having made his trip uh, to Korea. The Distinguished Flying Cross was one of the few medals he didn't own, so he now had one. The other 37 people on board, of course, weren't entitled to anything, uh, not even to MacArthur's uh, grand dinner. So this is how the offensive began. Uh, my book is about the eastern, northeastern front of that offensive, uh, largely led by the Marines, uh, who were supposed to go north to the Yalu River beyond uh, the Chosan Reservoir uh, and lock up North Korea for unifying the state. They couldn't do it. It was too cold. But a few of the troops from the 7th Division did it in Patton style. I have to explain that. 
Uh, when Patton was in Germany uh, at the end of World War II, when his troops got to the Rhine, they symbolically urinated into the Rhine. Now, maybe that's supposed to be macho. Uh, the troops at the Yalu uh, tried to copycat that. It was pretty cold. Uh, I assume some of them managed. But in any case, they didn't stay there very long. Uh, they evacuated quickly. Uh, they saw a few Japanese, uh, Chinese rather, on the other side of the, uh, of the Yalu, marching along. Uh, they didn't see any infiltration. They thought that everything was okay. It wasn't. It wasn't okay because the Chinese had figured out a way to infiltrate without our knowing it. They had built bridges across the Yalu River, wooden bridges, uh, about a foot below the surface so that we would not see the bridges from the air. And they crossed at night on these below the water bridges. They then hid in North Korea in railway tunnels, in caves, and in peasant houses. We didn't know they were there. The Yalu quickly froze over, and then they were able to cross over in, uh, in large dimensions. We couldn't in any way stop them. There were too many of them. Uh, they didn't have our equipment, but it didn't make any difference. They didn't need equipment. They had men, uh, a preponderance of men. They had summer uniforms and sneakers in 20 below zero and 30 below zero weather. Somehow, uh, despite tens of thousands of them dying of exposure, they chased the Marines back. I wanted to call my book Escape into Christmas. My publisher said, that's a downer. <clears throat> we need an uplifting title. Well, the book is about the escape into Christmas. And the title, A Christmas Far From Home, says nothing. Uh, it's not even uplifting. In fact, Tokyo Radio used to broadcast to the troops uh, as Christmas approached with Christmas carols that could be heard as far north as North Korea. Christmas carols like, I saw mommy kissing Santa Claus. That wasn't too uplifting. Who was mommy kissing? Uh, this was what was going on at the time. The Chosun Reservoir was frozen over. Uh, tr troops were being uh, infiltrated upon uh, with mortars, with, uh, with machine guns. Uh, the Chinese didn't have heavy artillery. Uh, they didn't even have primitive radios. Most of them didn't have radios. They were able to signal to each other by bugle calls and by lights. And these terrified the troops. Uh, the lights and the bugle calls and the, uh, the uh, musical and threatening way that they were able to signal. This is how they infiltrated, usually at night. Chosun Reservoir was frozen over. Uh, troops could cross on the reservoir ice. Uh, but this was a hell of a way to have to return. There was no way they could win the war uh, and be home by Christmas. There was no way they could even be on a ship going home for Christmas. They had to fight their way back. And when they were told by a reporter uh, to explain the retreat, uh, General Oliver Smith, who was commander of the Marines, said, uh, we're not retreating, we're fighting in another direction. Uh, that is, they had to fight their way back because there was no, uh, no front line. The Chinese were all around. When General Smith crossed into North Korea and went far north, he went as slowly as he could because he didn't want to be surrounded by the Chinese. He knew they were there. 
Edward Ullman, MacArthur's lackey, uh, said, don't be afraid of those Chinese laundrymen. Chinese laundrymen. Uh, they, they were more than that. When Smith crossed a narrow concrete bridge, uh, which uh, crossed the chasm, the Fuchilin chasm, it led water from the Chosun Reservoir to a power station. It was 4,000 feet up, and he realized this was pretty dangerous, a one-lane concrete bridge, 4,000 feet up. If we have to retreat, are we going to be able to get back? When the troops tried to return in 20 and 30 degree below zero weather, they found the bridge had been blown by the Chinese. There they were stuck. To me, it was one of the most dramatic chapters I've ever written in a book. How do you cross at night under fire a 4,000 foot chasm uh, at 20 below zero? They radioed for bridge parts. Uh, how do you get them? Uh, they radioed for girders, in other words. Uh, they were called treadways, treadway bridge sections, to be airdropped. They asked to have eight of them dropped to them, uh, a parachute attached to each end, uh, because they were each more than a ton in weight. And if they didn't drop accurately, they would be broken in landing. It was that cold. Well, of the eight that were dropped, five of them were dropped successfully and they managed to haul them uh, to the chasm. And at night, under fire, they were able to construct a bridge across the 4,000-foot chasm. Uh, it was almost impossible to do. Uh, they had space they had to fill in. The, the, the treadways weren't enough. And one of the engineers said, we'll fill them in with dead men dead men. The Marines and soldiers heard the words dead men, and they were sure that what was meant is that they would be taking frozen corpses and filling in the space, and that they would have to cross over frozen corpses. It turns out that dead men was an old term for railway timbers, railway ties, and that was what was used, railway ties that had been abandoned by the Japanese when it was a Japanese colony. Troops crossed, uh, tanks many tons in weight crossed, trucks crossed, one at a time. Uh, in some cases, the bridge was so narrow that, they, uh, th that the wheels overhung on each side as they crossed in the dark. Uh, they crossed with engineers in front of them with flashlights so they could see the way at two miles an hour, two miles an hour under fire. Only one truck, as far as I know, skidded off the bridge, skidded off. It had both living and dead soldiers in it. Uh, the Marines insisted they wanted to take back all the dead, and they took back as many as they could. The truck that skidded off fell all 4,000 feet down into the chasm, rear end first. And when it landed, the troops could see the headlights uh, staring up at them. It was a frightening sight, but they managed to cross. Uh, most of the troops did cross. They had a way to get across. They had to get down after that. And a chapter I call downhill all the way, they do get uh, to the harbor, the harbor from which they had come. Ninety-three ships had been sent from Japan uh, to rescue them and to bring them back to Japan. The last ship left Hongnam Harbor at 3 o'clock or maybe 3.15 on Christmas Eve. They had literally escaped into Christmas. I thought that was the end of the book. 
Then I was at the MacArthur Museum and uh, Archive uh, in Virginia, uh, and the curator said, uh, did you know about General Rowney? I said, no, what about General Rowney? He said, I've just interviewed General Rowney. He's 93 years old, and he was a, he was a lieutenant uh, and an engineer uh, on the beaches when the troops were evacuating. He was left behind. He and two enlisted men were left behind. General Almond and the others thought that they had everybody, but they didn't. Uh, Almond had quite a, a, a farewell, by the way. Uh, Almond, who I said was General MacArthur's toady and uh, deputy, airlifted to Korea when he arrived had airlifted uh, trailers that contained a kitchen and bedroom for him, uh, a bar uh, st well stocked with all kinds of things from frozen steaks to uh, expensive liquor. Uh, and he would have grand dinners uh, in his uh, trailer uh, while the Marines uh, 100 miles north uh, were starving in uh, 20 below zero weather. The trailers got moved to the beach. He wanted to take them back with him on board one of the ships. Uh, he invited all of the Marine officers, uh, leading officers, colonels and generals, uh, to uh, a dinner on the beach while the other troops were evacuating. Uh, soldiers in white coats served on fine china uh, while the shooting was going on elsewhere. And Lem Shepard, the Marine commander in Japan, uh, introduced the group. And he said, this is General Almond's birthday. We're celebrating his birthday. So they had a grand dinner celebrating his birthday while the tr other troops evacuated. But the three men left behind, Rowney and two enlisted men, had to somehow get back. They, they, didn't know what to do. According to his interview, one of his men said, we haven't blown up the sacks of dried milk on the beach. Why don't we lug them into an SOS shape and maybe a plane from up above will get to see the SOS. They did that. They were saved. A plane came down and uh, plucked them, took them off to Japan. Uh, Rowney, who was a lieutenant colonel, uh, went back to Japan and had dinner with his wife, who was there in Tokyo. The telephone rang. It was General Almond. Uh, Almond had gotten back down to South Korea. Where are you, he said. I need you back in Korea. He ordered Rowney back, and so Rowney had to leave his Christmas dinner with his wife and return to South Korea. This was a, a period of uh, not only great distress, but great confusion. Uh, I used as the epigraph to my book, the second law of thermodynamics, which says in effect, everything goes wrong. Uh, predictions are futile, everything goes wrong. And everything did go wrong. Uh, but it didn't go wrong for MacArthur right away. He blamed everybody else for the catastrophe. His general, his deputy, General Almond, uh, got rewarded for his um, stupidity. I think that's the only word to put it. Uh, when he returned to the States, he was made commander of the Army War College. What he taught them, I don't know, because he didn't really know very much. But it, he became commander of the Army War College. General Oliver Smith, who was a low-key hero, got nothing. Um, he should have been made commander of the Marines. He was not. He was given a minor job as commander of the Marines in, in the Atlantic Fleet. There were very few Marines in the Atlantic Fleet. 
He got nowhere. It was a surprising end uh, to a career. Uh, when I was in Washington a year ago uh, and speaking at uh, Fort Myer, I was asked, what's your next book going to be about? <clears throat> and I said, it's going to be about Korea. And I was asked, do you know about the Tootsie Rolls? I said, Tootsie Rolls in Korea? No. And he explained, Tootsie, the troops called for additional mortar shells. They ran out of 60 million mortar shells. But they had to radio to Japan for an airdrop of mortar shells in code because the Chinese were listening in. The code was Tootsie Rolls. Well, they were airdropped thousands of Tootsie Rolls. That will explain what was going on at the time. There are a lot of interesting stories in the book, and I can't tell you all of them, uh, but it was an exciting book to read uh, and a, a tale of very great heroism, which was helped, strangely, by the cold weather. Troops didn't bleed to death as they might have because it was so cold their blood coagulated. And that was a, a plus. One uh, Navy doctor uh, who was airlifting a man back to Japan because of his wounds gave him a letter to send to his wife uh, back in Philadelphia. And the soldier took it back with him. The uh, doctor didn't know that the soldier's wounds bled again when he left the frozen area, and his letter was covered with blood when it arrived in Philadelphia. His letter said, everything's fine out here. Uh, his mother fainted. <laughs> I think I'll stop there. I'll be glad to answer questions. I have a very bright light shining at me up above, so I really can't see you, but if you reach a microphone where I, where I can talk to you, I'll be glad to answer a question. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, the tale, as I heard it, is really a tale of heroism on one side and kind of incompetence on the other, and in this case, heroism came out. Having said that, there's so much, why do you think the Korean War doesn't get the attention. I understand this short time, but it's kind of, you know, at least my generation, kind of the lost between World War II and uh, Vietnam. First of all, is that an accurate description? And secondly, if so, why? When what you described there is just, a, you know, a marvelous story there was of heroism. There a lot of incompetence because troops had gotten soft during the occupation. The first troops that came in and many others from the 8th Army. Uh, I was in the 8th Army. There are many troops in the 8th Army were softened by the fact that they didn't even have to make their beds. Enlisted men didn't make their beds. They didn't do KP. Uh, they didn't often have to go on maneuvers to uh, practice uh, what they were supposed to learn about the, using weapons. Uh, so they arrived uh, in a state of disarray because they couldn't face what they didn't know about. And, and the incompetence stretched out to uh, officers, uh, lieutenant commanders, lieutenant um, uh, colonels, uh, all kinds of people were incompetent. And in many ways, they, they tried to learn, or they thought they were learning from World War II, those who uh, had experienced World War II and remained uh, in, uh, in uniform. For example, Walton Walker, uh, who was a lieutenant general and commander of the 8th Army on the western side of Korea, was a fan of General Patton. He had served under Patton. Uh, he, was, he had a specially equipped Jeep with a post in front next to the driver where he could stand uh, and, rather than sit and watch what was going on and take salutes from his troops. 
Uh, the Jeep crashed and he was killed. Uh, maybe he should have worn a seatbelt. <laughs> but uh, this is the sort of thing that happened. Grandstanding and incompetence. And it happens in every war. Uh, World War II was full of it. Uh, we don't learn about it because we don't want to know about it and the, the, the uh, general officers don't tell us about it. I mentioned in another talk uh, that in the invasion of North Africa, one of the leading generals, uh, a major general, Lloyd Fredendall, was an utter coward. He fled at the Kasserine Pass when the Germans came down. Uh, he fled, never returned, uh, had a bunker built for himself far away so he wouldn't be anywhere near the bombs. Well, he was finally relieved of duty. He was relieved of duty. He was promoted to lieutenant general and given a command back in the States. This is what happened with his cowardice. Why has, well, the forgotten war, I don't think it's forgotten. There are dozens and dozens of books about the Korean War. Uh, one of the most interesting books about the Korean War uh, by David Halberstam, which he calls The Coldest Winter, uh, is about the entire war, not one winter. But he says he began the book uh, at a library in Key West, Florida, where he found on the bookshelves, strange place to begin a research job on Korea, he found in the Key West Library 88 books on Vietnam and only four on the shelves on Korea. He said, maybe that explains that Korea is the forgotten war. My explanation is different. I think all those other books on the Korean war were taken out by people interested in it. <laughs> I can't prove that, but obviously uh, his figures are somehow in disarray. I don't know if I've answered your question. Yes, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Stanley? Yeah, I was wondering, uh, yeah. hi. I was wondering what the relationship was then between the incompetence, the incompetent leadership and the crack troops of the Marines who went in there. What did General Smith think of General MacArthur? And the story I heard also is this dinner you just described that I, I heard, uh, maybe it was in Halberstam's book, that the Marines took one look around and left the room. Is that true? Many of the Marines uh, involved in the 1st Marine Division had been veterans of the Pacific War in World War II. They knew about fighting. Uh, they, they had been in combat on the beaches of many islands in the Pacific. Uh, they were ready to fight. There is also, I think, an esprit de corps in the Marines that doesn't occur when you're a draftee in the Army. There's a big difference between a, uh, being a draftee uh, and uh, being a professional soldier. Uh, but as I said, there was also the softness that came with the occupation. And it, it began at the top. General MacArthur never knew what was going on among his troops because he never saw them. Only He saw them only on parade. He knew nothing much about them. Uh, eventually, uh, he learned, but he learned the hard way by reports of defeats. And when you have a his deputy uh, telling the troops, don't let a bunch of Chinese laundrymen scare you. Uh, you know that the realism is somehow short. It was not short in the Marines. What did Smith think of MacArthur? What did Smith think of MacArthur? I, I'm sorry, I can't. I, what did he ask? What did Smith think of MacArthur? Oh, wh what did Oliver Smith think of MacArthur? He cabled back to Marine headquarters in Washington when he was ordered up north to the Allo. This is a very desperate situation. Uh, we shouldn't be doing this. Uh, somehow can you get to MacArthur and uh, uh, alter his plans? Because this, it's going to go wrong. They didn't. They didn't because you couldn't tell MacArthur otherwise. One of MacArthur's senior officers said, uh, MacArthur is God. Literally, he said, MacArthur is God. Uh, you don't cross him. And no one did. That imperial style 
uh, which he brought with him to the Daiichi only got greater when he looked out on the emperor's palace and realized that he was higher than the emperor. Uh, that was a very bad situation. Uh, it wasn't reversed until Harry Truman fired MacArthur, sacked him, sent him back to Washington. Uh, MacArthur spoke to Congress uh, the day after he returned and gave that very famous speech with his quotation from the soldier song, old soldiers never die, they just fade away. He had no intentions of fading away. Uh, happily, he did. His replacement uh, was General Matthew Ridgway, who had been one of the deputy chiefs of staff and a paratroop uh, general in France in World War II. Uh, I saw General Ridgway over there, and he was a very interesting character. He came uh, in his uh, World War II combat uniform, uh, and he had his parachute harness, not a parachute, but he had his parachute harness uh, around his uh, chest, and on one side was strapped a, a hand grenade, and on the other side a, uh, uh, a, a medical kit. This is the way he dressed in France. And because he had these on both sides, he was known as old iron tits. <laughs> but troops admired him. He went into the fray. He wasn't afraid of shooting. Uh, and uh, he moved the troops back uh, so that by the time the truce finally occurred, uh, we were back at the 38th parallel where the uh, truce continues to this day. We had a big problem in ending the war, I should add. The problem was that many of the Chinese and North Koreans we captured didn't want to go home. They knew what it was like in the communist utopia. They had wanted nothing of it. As bad as things were in the prisoner of war camps we, we had, uh, they were better than the conditions were back home. They didn't want to go back, but the Geneva Convention on treatment of prisoners of war required repatriation of prisoners. There was only one complication. We didn't sign it, neither did the Chinese. Uh, so we weren't really qualified to do it. But the Chinese didn't want to end the war unless they could get all their troops home because they thought that anything else would be a propaganda defeat. Well, eventually they suffered a propaganda defeat. Tens of thousands of their troops refused to go home. Uh, the Chinese went to Taiwan, where they were welcomed. The North Koreans were accepted in South Korea. The war ended in 1953. I remember being on the troop ship coming home in early March of 1953 when the ship's radio announced Stalin had died. And I thought, well, the war's over. He had pulled the strings. It took another year after that for the war to end because of the prisoner of war situation. We didn't want to send prisoners home who did not want to go home. And finally, we succeeded in that, and the war ended in 1954. Any other questions? Well, thank you for listening.